Hi, everyone. Um, so um, we are here, Achke. We are going to be talking about IELTS. I I hope you all know what IELTS is, and uh, this is um, an IELTS consultation program. Usually, when we do it face to face, I make sure that it's very interactive. But since this is a live, um, the um, IELTS consultation program. So it's going to be what we're going to do is first I'm going to present and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what the test is all about and how you can do well and how to prepare for this test and um, what um, offers and resources British Council can provide to help you prepare for this test. And after that, we will be taking questions. So um, this would be like my presentation would be like for 30 minutes. I'm going to show you some videos. So make sure your audio is working as well. And um, on, before we start, let me first introduce myself. My name is Wasiman Shahir. I am the account relationship officer for British Council. And I've been working there for quite some time. And um, so um, today, um, what we will be doing is the IELTS consultation program. I hope you can all hear me properly and as well as see my screen. Um, so I have got this uh, PowerPoint presentation ready for you. So we'll just jump right to it without wasting any more time. So uh, this is the IELTS consultation program. And I hope you all know what IELTS is. But if you don't, I'm going to give you a brief overview about it. So. Um, IELTS, it stands for the International English Language Testing System. And basically, this is a test of your English proficiency. How well you can communicate in English is what this test is going to measure. And um, IELTS is owned by three institutions or three organizations. So there is the British Council, and then there is the IDP, and then there is the Cambridge Assessment English. So um, basically what happens is Cambridge is the, de they develop the content, um, they do the research, the analysis, and they develop the test. And British Council and IDP, we are the delivery partners, so we deliver the test. So uh, why would you need IELTS? You might ask this question. So um, if we simplify it, IELTS basically, as I have already mentioned, so IELTS will basically um, assess the English language ability of people. So if you are willing to study um, in a country where English is the main mode of communication, then you would probably need to sit for IELTS because you would find that most universities uh, would ask for an IELTS score. Uh, so it's going to be in their admission requirement. And if if not for studies, if you are willing to migrate to an English speaking country um, for work or just migrate there for good, then you also might need to sit for IELTS because you would find that nowadays IELTS is also a visa criteria set by many governments all around the world. So be it for study or for work or for just for migrating to an English speaking country, the most popular choice is IELTS test. So there are two types of IELTS. As I said, as there are two reasons for IELTS. There are two purposes. So either you, you need it for your higher education purpose or you might need it for your vocational or work purpose. So in that case, there are two different versions of IELTS test. So there is the academic test and then there is the general training test. So as the name suggests, academic test is if you're willing to study abroad and um, general training is for work purpose or for immigration purpose. So uh, there are cer certain differences between these two versions, um, which we will discuss later um, in my presentation. Uh, but um, this is just a quick question for you all. I know we're not, um, we can discuss this later, but um, you can think about it. What do you think? Which one is more, which one is easier? Is the academic IELTS easier or general training? That's a question for you to think about. But I'm going to be moving on to my next slide uh, where I will be discussing about the IELTS score. So um, 
can you tell me like uh do you know if there is any pass or fail we always ask our um audience when we do such events that is there any pass or fail for IELTS so basically there isn't because it only depends on your requirement so someone might need for example if someone is willing to um take admission in an engineering program, he might he or she might need a band score, which might be different for someone who is willing to get admitted in the business program of a university. So um, it totally depends on your requirement, where you're applying, for which purpose you're applying, because the requirement is set by the individual organization or the university that you're applying to. But IELTS is scored on a band scale of name, uh, band scale of nine and nine being the highest and zero is the lowest. So if you can see on my screen, um, so each band score or each band scale represents a certain level of English. And this is another reason why IELTS is so popular all around the world, because um, by looking at your score, anyone would understand what your English proficiency is. So for example, if someone gets a band score of six, that means he is a competent user of um, English, whereas band nine is for someone who, which indicates that that person is really good in English, using English, he's as well as a native speaker. And um, it is actually very difficult to get a band zero in the IELTS because that's, that only happens if you don't sit for the test or else you're not going to get a zero. So I'm sure that would be a relief to some of you. And um, so um, also apart from these ba nine band scale, there is also a half band width, we call it. So you might have heard that someone got an IELTS score of 6.5 or 7.5. So um, that basically uh, reflects on a level in between those two band scores. But you would find that that is also very common. Uh, and people do get half band width IELTS scores as well. So. Um, since IELTS has such a scoring system, which basically makes it very much easy for anyone to understand what uh, an individual's English proficiency is, that's why it's another reason why IELTS is so popular. So if we move on to the test format, so there are four uh, components that are being tested in this um, standardized test. So there is the listening section, and then there is the speaking test. And then there are reading and writing. So uh, we have already discussed that there are two versions of the test, the academic test and the general training. So there are certain differences and the differences lie in the reading and the writing components of the test. So um, other than that, the listening and speaking is the same for both general training and academic. So um, we're going to discuss a little bit more about each of these components and how you can actually prepare. If you're thinking of sitting for the IELTS test in the future, what you should do and how you can prepare. So keep watching. Um, I'm going to first um, show you a video on the listening test. So I'm going to get out of this presentation and play the video. I hope you all can see. Turn on your volume. So you've decided to take the IELTS exam. Great choice. It's the test that's tried and trusted throughout the world. The IELTS listening test is designed to assess your ability to understand spoken English. The listening test is the same regardless of whether you're taking the IELTS academic or general training module. These are key details of the IELTS listening test. The paper includes 40 questions spread over four sections in 30 minutes. The sections get more difficult as you progress through the test. You will only hear each passage once. It's vital you follow the instructions. For instance, if the question says, write no more than three words, any answer with four words or more is automatically marked wrong. At the end of the listening, you have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Write your answers carefully. Spelling is important. Capitalization, however, is not. There are no penalties for wrong answers, 
so attempt all the questions, even if you're not sure of the answer. Here are some tips to help you prepare for the test. You are given time to read the questions ahead of the listening. It's vital you analyze the questions here. Look for key words in the question. Usually the nouns or verbs. Underline or circle them. Make sure you know the type of answers needed. For instance, is it a name, a telephone number, an adjective? Try to predict as much as you can before you listen. Ask yourself, what is the situation? What is the topic? Who might be speaking? What might be the answers? Synonyms are important. There is often a word in a question and a different word with a similar meaning in the listening. Expect tricks. The speaker may try to confuse you. For example, they may give an answer and then change their decision. Also, be wary of negatives. Speakers might sometimes slip the word not into a sentence. Don't choose an answer just because you hear specific words. Consider the overall meaning carefully. Changes in the tone of voice can indicate this. For example, excitement or disappointment. Always have the next question in mind. It's easy to miss several answers if all of your focus is on one question. It's important to practice listening to a range of resources that might include television, films, radio, lectures, or online videos. Aim for a variety of sources of spoken English, particularly different accents. There is no substitute for practice. For more information on IELTS, please see our other videos on speaking, writing, and reading. Um, so I hope that was clear. I'm going to summarize what was said there, but yeah. So, um, so if you have watched the video, then you would know that's, for example, there would be four sections in the listening test and the difficulty level increases as you move forward. And um, you would be uh, given some questions in front of you and you would hear a recording uh, where their answers would be there. And then uh, you have to answer um, while listening to the recording. So the main challenge, I think, in case of listening is um, to do these two things simultaneously. So you have to read the questions and at the same time listen and find out the answers and write down the answers. So um, if you practice, then what happens is you get a grip of it and then you would find that it's quite uh, much easier for you. So there is no alternative to practice. <clears throat> and, um, and then there are certain things that you can do for the listening test and that is you need to work on your spelling because spelling is very important if your spelling is incorrect even if you have got the question and the answer correct you will not get a mark so please be careful about that and um as the video said the capitalization is not important so that does so that means it doesn't matter if you're writing in all lower cases or in upper cases it does not matter uh, but you need to get the spelling correct. So we're going to next look at some of the tips that can help you to do better in your listening. So uh, when there, there will be some time given to you when the recording starts, they would say that, for example, now you have some time to look at questions one to five. So in this, in this time, what you need to do is you need to Go through the questions, maybe highlight some keywords so that you know what is being asked. And in that way, when you hear those keywords, it's much easier for you to grasp the answer. And answers of the questions will appear in order, but pay attention to the word limits because um, for every question or for every set of questions, they would probably there would probably be a word limit. For example, no more than three words or no more than two words. So make sure you stick to that. Um, and um, check your answers when time is being given to you to check your answers. And the, another important tip is you can do guesswork because there is no negative marking. So for example, you miss question number six. And uh, so don't panic, focus on seven and eight and nine and 10. And then once the section is finished, 
what you can do is you can guess something for question number six and write down something there because even if it's wrong you won't be penalized but if it's right you get a mark so uh, uh, if this is especially handy when it comes to uh, questions like the multiple choice questions so you can just put a b c something and there is like one third possibility that your answer might be right so don't panic if you miss any answer just uh, do some guesswork if needed and stay focused uh, don't um don't panic if you miss something as i've already said and spelling is very important okay so you need to ace your spelling game to do good in the listening test so i'm gonna move on to the next section i hope this was pretty much clear um, so next is the reading section and in the reading section you'll be given three passages so as i said um, in the reading uh, component, uh, there is a difference between academic and um, general training module. So, um, for but in my experience, general training reading is a little bit easier, but um, it still depends on person to person. Uh, but in my experience, yes, uh, general training reading is a little bit easier but uh, than academic reading. But in general, there would be 40 questions in both academic and general training reading, and each question carries one mark, so your total mark would be 40. And um, then you would get, and you would get only 60 minutes to answer these 40 questions. So actually, I think the biggest challenge for reading is um, you don't get, um, you know, the time management, that can be a challenge because if you were given the same questions and two hours to complete it, trust me, you would find that your score is so much higher. But if for this, what you need to do is you need to, there is one technique that I want to talk about here, and that is called uh, scheming and scanning. And by that, I mean, I'm sure I, a lot of you might already know, and this is a basic technique for all sort of reading uh, tests that we do. And uh, scheming and scanning basically means that don't read the passages first, rather read the question first. And once you read the question, highlight some keywords and try to find out what you're being asked. And then search those keywords in your passage. And once you find it, read that section carefully to find out the answer. In this way, you can save time and um, it's gonna be more effective because if you, see if you actually go through the passages first and then try to attempt the questions then you would see that within an hour you might you won't be able to finish the test so uh, always go for the scheme and scan technique find the read the question try to find the answer in the passage where those words are mentioned and then once you read that section carefully you would find the answers and of course you need to practice a little bit and over here what you need to keep in mind is that there might be a lot of synonyms so try to learn as much as vocabulary as you can because that will really help you um and another thing uh for listening and reading for both the modules and components you only can use pencil and for the reading test there is no transfer time so what do we mean by transfer time um i did not discuss it in the listening um section so what happens is when you're uh, doing the listening test you're first writing your answers in the question booklet where the questions are given so you're listening to the recording and writing the answers at the same time and then after the test is over you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet but in the reading test, this 10 minutes is not there. So within the 60 minutes, you have to make sure that you write all your answers in the answer sheet because you won't be given any extra time to transfer, unlike reading. So please be careful about that. We have found that in some cases, some candidates do make this mistake. So um, we need to remind them. Uh, so because it's, you know, when they're under the test environment, they probably get a little bit stressed out and so they forget that in the reading test there is no transfer time um, so we're gonna move on and for the reading uh, the tips that uh, I'm going to share with you is that I have already talked about this that you know don't read the entire text but just scheme and scan um, you should be prepared for a variety of question types so there would be true false not given uh, fill in the blanks um, matching headings um, and then uh, maybe um, 
uh, multiple choice questions. So of course, practice is needed. Um, in general, you should try to read as much as you can. Try to read novels and uh, newspapers and magazines. In that way, you can learn a lot of vocabulary. Um, and then um, another thing, this is also mentioned here that there is no time to transfer answers, unlike the listening test. And also, you need to make sure that your answers are in the correct spaces on the answer sheet. So this might seem very silly to you, but trust me, this happens. For example, you miss a question. For example, you miss, you, you don't know the answer to question number 26. So you leave that blank and you're supposed to, the next answers would be on 27, in the box for 27, in the box for 28. But often when people, uh, candidates are transferring, they probably just, you know, write the question, the answer to question number 27 in the box for question number 26. And that's when, you know, the, all their next answers go wrong. So uh, when you're transferring, please be, ma please make sure and be extra careful that you're transferring to the correct spaces on the answer sheet. And um, there is no transfer time. So within 60 minutes, you have to complete the whole test. All right, so next is the writing. Um, personally, I think writing is the most difficult. I don't know, I have always struggled in writing, but um, if you're a good writer, it, as I said, this, can totally, this varies totally from person to person. Some people find it very easy to write. So in the writing test, there would be two tasks given to you. So one is the, um, the first one is task one where for the and uh, over here in the uh, there are some differences between general training and academic so um for academic uh task one uh you would be given uh you would be asked to write a report and it might be on so there might be a graphical representation it can be a bar chart a line graph or a picture that you have to explain and basically write a report by summarizing the main points and also you have to make comparisons and um, for general training, um, what happens is for your task one, it is just uh, letter writing. So you would be asked to write a letter. So, um, you know, there can be two types of letters. So you need to understand um, whether you're being asked to write a letter, for example, to the community leader in your area. In that case, it would be a formal letter. So your tone needs to be formal. And if you're asked to write a letter to your friend, of course, that can be a little bit informal. So you need to understand whether, you know, and catch the right tone. And that should reflect in your writing. And um, there would be some points given which you need to address in your letter. And there is a word limit of 150 words. And for task two, it's the same for academic and general training. And it's basically an essay that you have to write. Um, and usually, uh, mostly in IELTS test, we get to see that there is mostly argumentative essays. So um, make sure that you follow a certain structure. Um, for To me, I think a good structure is there should be a clear introduction. And then you need to discuss both sides of the argument and then give your opinion and then a conclusion so uh but then there is no hard rule that you have to write three paragraphs or you have to write four or five paragraphs that completely depends on you but we're going to discuss how you will be assessed so the first assessment criteria is the task achievement so we will see how well you have answered the question so there will be some questions and how well you have answered those that will be seen and also whether you can present and overview and address the main trends. This is for the academic module. And then we would see whether, you're have, whether your writing is structured and whether it's well organized or not. So that's why it's very important to plan first. Like whenever you're writing something, not only for the IELTS test, but whenever you're writing something, I think it's a very good idea if you take just five minutes and think about it, think what you're gonna write and then start writing. In this way, your um, answer and your writing would be more structured and much, much clearer, okay? Um, and then by lexical resource, we mean the vocabulary that you're using. So try to use different words, but make sure you're using it in the right context. Um, and of course, your grammar is going to be checked, uh, whether you're using simple structures or whether you're using complex sentences. I think um, it's a good idea to use linking words, such as moreover, in addition to, however, on the other hand, 
because these improve your sentence structure a lot. So try to use linking words and try to um, write, don't just write simple sentences, try to make, uh, try to write a little bit of different types of um, forms, try to use that. And uh, so use a mixture, that is our uh, tip over here. So try to use a mixture of long and short sentences, and um, but also make sure that it's easy for the examiner to understand what you're trying to say because that will totally affect your mark. So uh, grammar is important, vocabulary is important, and um, structure, and also whether you have answered the question properly or not. So it, that's why always read the question properly first and then start writing because often it's very easy to just get off track, you know, and just talk about something that is not related to the topic. So that's why be very careful that you're addressing to the question and um, making sure that you're um, sticking to the word limit. Uh, for task one, the word limit is 150 words, and for task two, it's 250 words. So as you can understand, task two is more important. So basically, the weight distribution is 60% and 40% um, from, from task one and task two. So it does not carry an equal weight. So um, that's why also it's said that you should spend like 40 minutes on task two and 20 minutes on task one. So. And the total time for your test is one hour. So, and that's divided in 40 minutes for task two and 20 minutes for task one. But um, you can, it's up to you how you utilize your time. But of course, task two is more important. It carries a higher weight. And um, that's why you're asked to write more words in task two, 250 words. And you should always make sure that you never write under length. Because if even if your writing is really good, you don't make any grammatical errors, and you are, um, you know, you're you're addressing the question very well, and your grammar and vocabulary is really top notch, but your writing is under length. By under length, I mean you're not meeting the word length, word limit. Uh, so, for example, for task two, you have written something within 200 words. So that will definitely affect your score a lot. So always make sure that you maintain and you stick to the word limit. So and don't go too overboard because you are not going to get that much of time either. So for task one, try to write anything between 150 to 170, 180 words. For task two, 250 to 300 words is good. So for writing, as I said, the tips that you need to know or you need to remember is, um, of course, planning first, so, so that you know your writing is very structured, staying to keeping to the topic so that you don't talk about unrelated subjects and you don't go off track. Never copy the sentences from the question because you're not going to get any marks from this. Uh, so be creative. Try to use synonyms, but don't copy the whole thing from the question. A lot of students, we have seen that they what they do in the introduction of task two is that they copy the whole question um, in their essay, and that's not a very good practice. And you need to be organized. You need to maintain the word limit, because if you don't, you're going to lose marks. And um, you need to manage your time, one hour. But uh, remember that task two is more important than task one. And for, um, for task one, uh, for academic version of task one, you need to maintain um, and highlight the key features and also uh, make comparisons. And for task two, you, you should use examples to support your argument, but do not use any personal examples. For example, if a topic is um, students nowadays are allowed or should be allowed to work part time beside their studies. Do you think this is a good development or a bad development? So this is clearly an argumentative topic where there are two sides. Some can say it's good, some can say it's bad. So whichever side you choose, that's fine. Give um, give points to support your argument, but never and give examples. For example, you can say what's happening in your country, what's happening all over the world. You can pick up a certain country and talk about part-time jobs for students how it's affecting everyone but never say that oh my younger brother is working and he is doing this and that or my friend is working beside 
her education and she's doing this or that. So never use personal examples. It always has to be general examples. And you, need, you can talk about your country, you can talk about the world, but never use personal examples in task two. All right, so next we are going to talk about the speaking test. And I think this is the easiest. I have been talking nonstop for the past, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so uh, how hard can it be? So in the speaking test, um, it's going to be a one-on-one, -on -one, face to face interview with an examiner. The whole test is recorded and you're going to be assessed throughout the test. And um, the whole the duration for this can last between 11 to 14 minutes. Uh, so you, there are three parts to the speaking test. Part one is where you'll be asked some basic questions. And then in part two, you'll be given a topic and you'll be given one to two minutes to talk about that topic. Uh, and then in part three, uh, the examiner is going to ask you further questions related to the topic that you've been given in part two. So, um, uh, of course, you need to be in the practice of speaking. So try to speak uh, at home. With maybe uh, with your friends, you can uh, you know open up a WhatsApp group where you and open up a speaking club where you can talk to your friends about different things in English every day for at least thirty minutes. Because for fluency, you need to be in the practice of speaking English. So um, and your speaking test will be assessed on the following criteria as shown on the screen. So firstly, there is the fluency and coherence. So and by fluency, we do not mean that you have to speak very fast. That's not what we mean. Um, what we mean is it has to be uh, without any hesitation. The, your talking should be coherent and uh, there shouldn't be very there shouldn't be uh, long pauses. Like don't hesitate and don't take too long to respond. OK. Uh, but it does not mean that you have to talk really fast. Okay, that's not what we mean by fluency. And then there is, of course, your lexical resource. Basically, we're going to see how, what kind of vocabulary you're using and, um, you know, whether you're using it in the right context or not. Um, then your grammar will be checked. Um, the, um, you know, like what kind of sentences you're using, the structures, the accuracy and your pronunciation. So um, don't worry about your accent, but make sure your pronunciation is good because so that you can be understood very easily and um, you can also understand the examiner and the examiner can understand you. So pronunciation is very important. So work on your pronunciation, but um, don't um, try to copy an accent, try to sound natural, okay? Uh, because accent does not matter, it's, um, it's a complete, myth that for example if i speak in british accent which i can't but um if i do speak in british accent it's not necessary that i'm gonna get a good higher score but what's more important is whether i am easy to understand or not and whether i am answering the questions uh, properly or not so what's being asked i'm answering to the point because if i don't answer to the point the examiner would think that i don't understand his or her questions and that is a huge lacking in my communication so listen to the question properly, answer, and when you're speaking, don't worry about your grammar, rather focus on expressing yourself. Um, so now I'm going to show you a video on speaking tips. Um, so I'm getting out of this and playing the video. Fact one, Scrum is highly productive. Evidence, I increased the sales last month for 17%. Fact two, Scrum is creative. It is the most conceptualized way of approaching this. Fact three, Scrum has leadership. Scrum managed to increase morale 69%. Morale just showed up.
I'm not uh, expressing positive things. Mm -hmm. Good vibes, and I think more colorful. When I hate them, I know. Would you like to tell me about your hometown? Yes! Woo! Thanks, Dennis. Porto, the country's second large city, is in itself full of interest, but the district it has, though largely industrialized, offers the visitor plenty to see. Along the coast, holidays resort like uh, the cosmopolitan beach of Espino, splendid seafood or traditional fishing towns, quaint self charm of Amaranth with 17th century mansions, famous for a kind of sweet egg pastries called bellies of angels. Thank you. Um, what is the most interesting building in your hometown? Church? The old church? It's big. It's Tell me something you like about your job. Describe a person who has had a big effect on your life. Um, you should say uh, how you met that person and why that person had such an effect. Okay. So the tips for speaking is, of course, never memorize your answers. Try to um, be natural uh, because examiners are well trained. They would understand if, you're if, if you have memorized an answer or not. So don't memorize. Um, maintaining eye contact is important. Um, and also um, always try to extend and uh, never give one word answers. For example, if you're asked, uh, where do you live? For example, if someone asks me where where do I live, I would say I live in. Then you say which area you live in. For example, I live in Tanmondi, and I have been living here for the past five years. Okay, so this is an example of a good answer because, uh, or you could have just said, uh, "Where do you live, Tanmondi?" Okay, so that actually won't help you converse more with the person. So make sure you never give one-word answers. You always extend what you say and at least say at least one or two sentences <clears throat> for each question. And uh, don't talk about anything that might make you over emotional. And um, it's okay to always, not necessarily always have to say positive things. Like, you know, if I ask you, do you read books? You, it's not necessary that you have to say, yes, I read books. Maybe you don't. So then you can actually just be honest and say, no, I don't read usually read books and that's fine because that will give you more to say uh, so um, I hope this video was helpful and we're gonna move on um, and I'm going to talk about some facts and figures so when you're sitting for the IELTS test there are two um, 
they, uh, there is the paper-based test and the computer-based test. And results for the paper-based test gets released within 13 days. And for computer-delivered IELTS, you will get your results within five days. Um, in 2017, there were like over 3 million tests taken all over the world. So you can understand what, that this IELTS test is really popular. Um, and you're in, when you take an IELTS test, your IELTS certificate would stay valid for two years. And there are over 10,000 organizations around the world that recognize the IELTS test. And if you're only looking, talking about the US, then there are more than 3,000 institutions that recognize IELTS, including Ivy League colleges. Global accessibility. So uh, in the presentation, um, every place that is marked red is where you can actually sit for the IELTS test. So. Um, you know, the IELTS test is, um, of course, uh, it's very accessible because no matter where you are, you would find that you can sit for it. So there are more than 1,100 testing locations in around 140 countries where you can sit for the test. And if we're talking about the Bangladesh context, so um, we test in a lot of cities. There is, we test in Dhaka, we test in um, Silet, we test in Chittagong, and then we test in Rashahi, Kulna, um, and then um, Kumila, okay, uh, sometimes in Jasor. So, um, you know, you can um, check our website to see the test dates and locations. But yes, we test in around seven places, seven cities in Bangladesh. And IELTS is a test that you can trust. It's, it's valid and it's reliable. It follows a very strict security. So um, you will... This is something that's what, that's another reason why institutions really depend on IELTS and why it's so popular because you know it's very reliable. Mm. How can you register? So you can register online, and we also have our network of registration centers where you can go and they will register you on your behalf. And um, so you can find that the list of our registration centers on our website www.britishcouncil.org.bd. And then you can pay online, so given the current situation, it's easier, I think, if you can make the payment from the comfort of your home. So there is an online payment option, or you can pay actually pay at the Standard Chartered Bank, uh, or you can pay at one of our IELTS registration centers. And for the IELTS test, only thing that you would need is a valid passport. Without a passport, you cannot sit for the test. So that's uh, completely mandatory. And other than that, you won't really need anything except for the fees, which is 17,500 at the moment for this year. Um, so with the British Council, if you sit for IELTS, you get an option to choose between the paper base and the computer delivered IELTS. Uh, we have a friendly staff um, and a dedicated staff uh, for our customers who will help you with your IELTS queries and registration queries. Uh, we use um, state-of-the-art wireless headphones in our listening test, so that will give you a very smooth uh, test day experience. And also you can dispatch your certificate by TRF, we mean the IELTS test certificate, and you can dispatch it to five universities by post. If you wanna know more about this, then we can talk about it later. And for preparation, I'm going to suggest you three websites so you can keep a note of this. So there is Road to IELTS where once you register for the test, you're going to get 30 hours access. And um, in general, anyone can get up to 10 hours of access, but once a candidate registers for the test, then he or she would get 30 hours of access. And there are lots of uh, preparation materials in Road to IELTS. And then you can take support from Learn English and Take IELTS. Um, these are two websites you can just Google on, on your computer and um, you would find that there are a lot of practice materials on these websites. And um, we also uh, sometimes provide uh, preparation workshops which are conducted by IELTS experts in our partner premises. But in this current situation, um, the workshops are not being continued at the moment because of safety reasons. So uh, that's kind of the end of my presentation. So now I'm going to take questions from you if you have any.
All right, so um, I can, so since you don't have any questions, so that's all from me. Hope you have, hope this session was useful to you. And uh, take care, stay safe, bye.